at the hour of our death. Amen. And you know, I have noticed that many, many of our sins and additions come from the father wound. I've noticed this over and over again, like, like two thirds. And I noticed this too about exorcisms. I had to do quite a number on teenagers in one year that every single teenager I had to release from Satan's grasp, I mean serious cases, every one of them had a broken relationship with their fathers. Every single one. And so there's a great Catholic psychologist named Dr. Paul Vitz. He was an atheist. And he was converted miraculously in college to Christianity. He was a, a strong atheist and an intelligent one at that. He became a Christian. And then what's so beautiful is after a few years as a follower of Christ, it wasn't enough. He needed something more, more perfect, more intelligent, more deep. He became Roman Catholic. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So to give a Catholic psychologist, Brilliant. Any of his books are good. If you can find them, buy one. Do yourself a favor. Dr. Paul Vitz, V-I-T-Z. Dr. Paul Vitz, amazing man. Teaches at a university in New York. And he did a study of atheism. Now, as a devout Catholic, but a rigid scientist. I mean, a smart and brilliant scientist. You know what Dr. Paul did? He did a survey of the lives of 100 of the leading atheists of all history including Madeline Murray O'Hare, by the way, also John Lennon and Marx, all the way back down to the Greek fathers, all the leading atheists of world history, 100 of them. And there's a chapter in the book for all of them, little tiny chapters, and you see about the details of their lives. He did this scientifically, and he discovered something that you need to know. All the atheists in world history, and they willing to say all of them right now in Washington. They all had one thing and only one thing in common. What do you think that was? A lack of a father. Every single one. Zero exceptions. Zero. Zero. All 100 of the leading 80s in world history, their father either died while they were young, or he abandoned wife and children, or he beat them mercilessly, or he was there, but he never said, I love you. He was there, but like wallpaper in the background. Every single one, that's unbelievable. And like Dr. Vitz said, when you do a scientific experiment, this is a scientific experiment, if you get a 51% margin of victory, success, you're doing well in science. If you get a 51 percentile, so 49% maybe no, but 51% yes. If you get a 66%, that's like two thirds, you're doing extremely well in science. It has to be repeatable. This is 100% success rate. It's almost unheard of, you see, in science, almost unheard of. And so Dr. Vitz being a great scientist said, we need now to test the contrary. That's what you do in science, you test the contrary. So he made a list of 100 of the leading Men of world history. Men who were generous, kind, gracious, and good, fruitful, happy, and fulfilled, like General George Washington. See? Like Wilberforce from England, the man who actually set the slaves free, Dr. Wilberforce. Men like this throughout history. Men like Socrates and Aristotle. Holy, and a few women there too, great leaders of time, all time. He went through all 100. There's a chapter on each one. Guess what? What factor and only one factor that all 100 leaders of the history of the world, good leaders I mean, have in common? Good fathers. Is that incredible? That never happens. Never. Not 95%. Not 99%. All of them. Every single one had either a marvelous godly father like St. Joseph, right? Or if Papa died, it's not Papa's fault, Grandpa stepped in with even more love. If Grandpa wasn't available, Uncle Joe stepped in with more love. Or, and some of them, it was actually a Catholic priest who became their father. Is that incredible? Yes. Every single, 
And so we see in Washington State, in United States of America, it was designed, it's always been planned, you know, by the communists more than 100 years ago. Just read Dr. Bella Dodd, read her book, who Bishop Sheen brought into the Catholic Church. Being an atheist communist, he brought her into the Catholic Church. She was on the inside. She helped, by the way, 1,000 men infiltrate the seminaries. Atheistic communists to infiltrate the seminaries. This, what we're going through right now, coming to a pinnacle, was planned on around a drawing board more than a hundred years ago. And one of the main goals was to destroy the family. They had two main goals, of course, to destroy the Roman Catholic Church through the priesthood, right? And to destroy the family. And they figured the best way to do that was to make men into women. And women into men. In the church and in the family. So the things we're noticing, these things were all planned years ago and infiltrated. And so you see that the women's right movement, give me a break. Of course we need to give rights to everybody, but the idea that men are vow, all men, we don't need men, just impregnate me and I'll raise the children without Papa, is destroying the world. It's destroying civilization right now. We need a father and a mother. Amen? Amen. We need them both. Amen? Amen? So all this was, was planned. And when God restores the world, what kind of priest and man will we be? Oh my gosh. Do you realize what's coming? God will restore the human race, as he said to Louisa Bicaretta, like the Garden of Eden. And every man will be a man. Every woman will be a woman. And every child will be pure and innocent. Amen. Amen. Mamma mia, what God has planned for us. Amen. Amen. And so there I was, University of Florida in Gainesville, kind of lonely, starting to get temptations of suicide. And I realized what happened was that I had never really completely felt uh, not just my daddy's love, but not even God's love at that time. I had some sort of barrier. And we see that on so many teenagers today, like a barrier to receiving faith and love. They've been so indoctrinated, you see, in such a way they turn their hearts away from the possibility of God. Which is incredible, because God is the only possibility. He made everything. Amen? Amen. And so, what a battle we're in right now. And God saved my life, partly through music, Music began to save my life when I was in University of Florida. They had like a sound system there, a special room for students. You go in and listen to music. And I discovered some music. I'm going to tell you, this is really funny. It's kind of goofy. God uses goofy things, doesn't he? And he uses goofy things in our lives to touch us in profound ways. I, I found out with my student card, there was a special music booth there in the student center. You go in these little booths, and you pick out the music you want from the guy at the front counter, and they play it for you as you go in the booth. They turn the lights off, you have the speakers on, and you can listen to Mozart, you see, or Beethoven, or some people listen to Madonna. <laughs> uh, I love Madonna. I pray her rosary, but not the other Madonna. I pray for her. You can listen to whatever you want to do on those speakers. And the Lord led me, because I heard a tune, to listen to the music of an artist that you probably know. I don't usually say this in homilies. The Lord says, I can share this with you. His name is Neil Diamond. <laughs> Have you ever heard his album for B, for Jonathan Livingston Seagull? Yes. Oh, inspired is to put it mildly. Inspired to put it mildly. And his voice is a rich baritone voice. A rich baritone voice. I'd go there every day and hear one or two of his albums. Incredible songs. And the fatherliness of his voice and his music and the words of his music. B, he says, like an empty page. 
page longing for a word to be written on it. Oh my gosh, where does that come from? Incredible lyrics in the fatherly voice. I realized God was ministering the Father's love to me. God, though, really zapped me a few months later. We had a retreat at the University of Florida, the Catholic Student Center. I decided to make it with all the other young people. And it was an amazing and a good retreat for college kids to put us in contact with Jesus. And it really, um, it was beautiful, but it wasn't touching me for some reason. I think that I was too much of a thinker and I was thinking through all they were doing, like the blindfold fall, you know, very beautiful for kids, especially, put a blindfold on you and say, now fall backwards and trust God. Whoa, there's somebody back there to catch you, you see? Kind of like being slain in the spirit. And so I thought they were all beautiful and all good and I did them, but I figured them out in advance. So it wasn't really touching me. Like, okay, well, a human being did that. I want God. I think it's cool what they did, but I want, I want something more, something deeper. And so at the end of the retreat on Sunday night, we ended with confession and an amazing fiesta, and everybody was literally crying for joy. I was crying too. Everyone was crying for joy, and I was crying for sadness. And my friends were all rejoicing, and we all had tears in our eyes and said, Jim, isn't it great? And I just nodded my head. I was dying inside. Everybody was so filled with joy, and I was, my loneliness had been doubled during the retreat. Doubled. Especially when all your friends are happy and you're miserable. I felt terrible. I had to get out of there. Like I couldn't breathe. I just left. I said, I'm going to bed. I just left and went to the dormitory. I thought I'd be all by myself. I'm just going to cry in my bed and have a nice pity party and go to sleep. And I went back to the dorm, slammed open the door. And there's two other guys already there. I'm going to go by myself, you know what I mean? I must feel sorry for myself. And they looked up and said, Jim, what are you doing here? And I looked at them. I was so upset that anybody was there. I needed the private space. But I said, it came out. And I said to them, all of you guys are feeling joy. You all feel Jesus and you feel joy. And here I am, I'm called to be a priest, and I can't feel anything at all. And I began to break up. You know, called to be a priest, and I can't feel anything. You all feel him, I can't feel anything. And I ran out of the doors. I was weeping, slammed out into the, into the forest. It was in the middle of a, of a, like a state park. Not like this, it was like forest. And ran into the trees, and I was gone. I was so upset. My loneliness was coming to a peak of all my 19 years when I needed to hear my dad say to me, Jim, I love you. You're the best boy in the world. I love you. I need to hear that. I need to hear my God. Like we took Abraham outside with his arm around his shoulder. I need your arm around my shoulder. Amen. Amen. If it's good enough for Abraham, ain't it good enough for me? I need you too. You're my God, and I'm your son, and I need something more. And I went out sad and angry and crying. I couldn't bear it. Yes, I had good grades. I had 4.0 average, a full scholarship. It meant nothing at all. Nothing. I need God. And I still need him today. I'm in love with God. And he knows it. He's winking at me right now. But I needed him. No fake stuff. I need God. And I went after I was weeping and I was crying. And I, I found a clearing like this in the middle of the woods and I stopped out of breath. And I was weeping all by myself, feeling lonely, feeling deadly, feeling deathly. When I felt some phenomenon in my body. And all I could do is try to describe it. But it was like a feeling of poison. Poison in my feet. And it was a horrendous feeling like absolute alienation and dejection. Kind of like what people feel perhaps when they go to hell. Not that I was a great sinner, but I was a great lonely one. I was lonely. And this poison, lonely alienation feeling went up my knees and my legs and my belly into my chest. This horrible feeling. 
and I could feel it was all the loneliness and pain and sorrow of my life. It went right up to my chest and into my throat. I began to groan, this poison feeling of all the sadness and loneliness of my life. When it got to my throat, I was starting to choke. And I groaned. And I remember that I said this word. Why? Why? Why am I so lonely? Why is life so hard? I don't get it. This isn't fun at all. Why? And I, I groaned. Why? And it's that very moment when I groaned this why, involuntarily, but honestly, my eyes were closed and weeping. It was midnight, it was dark. I felt fingers on my chin. I felt a hand come down and touch my chin like this. Very gentle. Now I realize it was me. Gentle, and these beautiful fingers moved my chin upwards like this as I was weeping. Can you imagine Mary's compassion, Our Lady's compassion, to come into the middle of the woods in Florida to rescue one teenager? And my chin moved up involuntarily, it was, it was being moved. And so I was surprised by what I was experiencing and I opened my eyes. At the very moment I opened my eyes, a star, the biggest star I've ever seen, at the very moment my eyes opened, flashed across the sky. My eyes had been closed for like five minutes. Fingers open my, move my chin up. I open my eyes. The moment my eyes open, not a second before, I saw this incredible star. And I knelt down, stunned. And I started to get scared. Because I suddenly realized, oh no, it's all real. God is real. It's all real. He heard me. He heard me. He's real. Oh my God. God just spoke to me. Oh no. Then I called out, wait a minute. If he spoke to me, he loves me. Because yeah. if you're a father and you love your children, then you say to your children, I love you. That's what a father does. The father says, this is my beloved son. I'm well pleased with my son. Listen to my son. Amen? Amen. Well, beloved, to put it mildly, that changed my life. Suddenly, it, to me, it was like the temple of the ancient Jews, the day that Christ Jesus was crucified, and the earthquake occurred in the temple. And the veil in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the public was rent in two. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that it was rent in two, divided in two, and suddenly you could see the Holy of Holies and enter in. Amen? Amen. When that star flashed across the sky, some veil was torn in two, and I saw God. And something inside of me was ripped open. Ripped open inside of me. No more barriers between me and the Holy One. Because I want to tell you something. We were made for Him. And our hearts are restless until they rest in Him. Amen? Amen. You were made for God. You were not made for spaghetti and meatballs. <laughs> and I love them. If you have any extra, give it to me after the Mass. <laughs> we were not made for that. We were not made for Taco Bell either. We were made for God. We have to have God. Amen? Amen. And you have to breathe God. You have to breathe God. There was a famous story of an old 
novice master, a holy saint in the monastery. And a young monk came up to the old novice master and said to him, Father, Father, please, Father, teach me the way of holiness. I want to pray like you. And the old saintly novice master, like Bernard of Clairvaux, he got up and said, Yes, Iho, yes, my son, I will teach you. Come follow me. And the beautiful old saintly father priest took the young novice master that followed me and began walking out into nature. And they walked across this beautiful green field. And the young novice said, Oh, I get it. Father is teaching me that our God is the God of creation. And he gives me beautiful valleys in my life. But the father just kept going. And then he climbed up a mountain. And the most novice, the young novice, fallen, went up there and said, Wow, kind of rough. This is rugged with rocks and it's very steep. He's teaching me that sometimes the spiritual journey is difficult. Sometimes you get bloody. Then he went down to another valley. Said, oh, okay, you see me, there is consolation. Then he went through a forest. Now he's getting confused. After he gets through the forest, the saintly father keeps going up to a body of water. As I get it, he's going to show me that I was baptized in water. I must be immersed in the Holy Spirit and God. So he went right to the water. And then the father kept walking into the lake. And more, he turned around because the boy was waiting. He went. So he kept walking and the water went up to his waist and then went to his chest. He turned around, and there's the young novice room. Now he's really quizzical. And father says to the novice, now my son, bow your head. And the young man thought, he's going to give me his blessing. <laughs> so father reached out his hand like this, and then took the young man's head and slowly pushed it into the water. And the young boy was thinking under the water, he's renewing my baptism. And after about 30 seconds, he says, I've had enough renewal. <laughs> after about 45 seconds, he was losing his breath. After about a minute, he was getting desperate. He found he began to push and push. He began to scream under the water, but he couldn't get the air into his lungs. And he pushed, and he was dying. And the older monk just held his head there. And finally, the old monk released his hand, and the young novice popped up out of the water. He screamed as best he could because he was no no breath. Why did you do that? What, what are you doing? You're telling me what are you doing? And father said to him, "When you desire God." the way you just now desired oxygen. Come back and I'll teach you how to pray. Amen? Ooh, baby! And so, beloved, desire God more than oxygen. Amen? Honestly, I mean that for real. If you don't have the gift, ask Mama for the gift because she had it. Ask her for the gift to desire God more than life itself. Amen? Amen? And by the way, that includes the Eucharist. Desire the Eucharist more than life itself. Amen? Amen. So just to bring a, another story to a conclusion, my experience in Gainesville, uh, I, was, I was hungry for God and only for God, I was ready to die. And he, he broke through. And to give you some idea of how marvelous God is, I decided to tell my favorite professor three days later on the campus of the University of Florida in Gainesville. His name was Dr. Griffey. He was my philosophy professor. He was an amazing man. He looked like Socrates with white hair and a big white beard. Some of our classes we had at his house and he and his wife would feed us wine and cheese as we discussed philosophy. He was the best professor I ever had. I love Dr. Griffey. He was like the father I never had. He was so kind. And Dr. Grafey was an atheist. 
He had more love than most priests that I know. Sad to say. Although God's going to change everything soon. Every atheist will become Catholic. And every priest will become a saint. Amen? That's what's coming. So I told Dr. Griffin, after I said, Doctor, I need to speak to you. So we went outside on the yard. I said, Dr. Griffin, you won't believe what happened to me. And I was dying, and I was lonely, and I cried out to God, and you won't believe what happened. And then I felt these fingers, and it lifted my head, and right then, it... as I went to tell Dr. Griffin about the shooting star, right then, I said, and, and, a star right then flashed over his head in the sky right then. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I went to tell him. I didn't have to tell him. He saw it. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said to me, Hmm, Jim. Maybe there is something to this God of yours. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'm here to tell you, Washington, there is something to this God of yours. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. He is all you will ever need. He is all that we should desire. He is everything. I'm in love. I'm in love. He is beautiful. Amen. Amen. Rend your heart and not your garments. Rend your heart. Rip it open today. And say, God, I want you and only you forever. Amen. Amen. And Jesus Christ, our Lord, and through the Holy Virgin. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of